Good morning, brothers and sisters, friends of North Mississippi Rural Legal Services, and particularly to all my old colleagues and friends. I am deeply indebted for your friendship and your long-lasting courage in the fight for freedom. 50 years, the quest for justice in Mississippi, North Mississippi Rural Legal Services at this continuing education litigation seminar. In celebration of the 50th anniversary of North Mississippi Rural Legal Services program at the University of Mississippi School of Law, Ben Cole, the executive director, invited me to reflect on my tenure as staff attorney with the program from 1969 to 1971. I was accepted after a competitive application process to become a lawyer for the Poor and Neighborhood Legal Services Program, as you heard from Mike Trister, called the Reginald Heber Smith Fellow Program, or Reggie, in 1969. Preston Johnson created a paradox when he modified the guns versus butter statement, meaning a nation must choose war or domestic programs into guns and butter policy that he proclaimed he could do both. The president maintained a huge costly war in Vietnam resulting in more than 50,000 military casualties. And the simultaneously created a popular social program called the War on Poverty, featuring Head Start for elderly, neighborhood legal services as we know for the poor, Medicare health care for the elderly, Thus, I engaged in an active protest against one of President Johnson's major policies in the war. However, I took advantage of another foremost policy of legal services. The nation celebrated the 50th anniversary of those social programs, including Head Start, in 2015. The Reggie program, which offered specialized training to a core of young lawyers within legal services, to address systematic root causes of poverty with reform strategies, assigned me to North Mississippi Rural Legal Services in Oxford. Mike Trister had interviewed me in Washington, D.C. Mike, as the executive director, went on to lead me in my two-year career. When I arrived at Oxford, my immediate supervisor was Kent Spriggs, who is here today, the deputy executive director, and now the editor of a book on civil rights lawyers' experiences in Mississippi in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. This paper is an excerpt from my chapter in the book, scheduled for publication in 2017. I chose Mississippi for non-legal purpose and obtained a lifelong benefit for another purpose. My selection of Mississippi was part of a successful plan to dodge the draft in the Vietnam War. I agree with Dr. Martin Luther King that the war was illegal, unjust, and immoral. I submitted a written request to my Selective Service System Draft Board in Norwalk, Connecticut to grant a 2A deferment from the draft to help African American people in Mississippi gain their civil rights. The 2A regulation created a category of registrants intended to serve the nation's public safety and interest. The Selective Service granted a 2A deferment to police officers, of firefighters, and teachers, but to my knowledge, not to a poverty and civil rights lawyer in the South. To this day, I'm shockingly surprised and deeply grateful that the local draft board granted my request. I went to Mississippi in 1969, immediately upon graduation from law school, to become a poverty and civil rights lawyer. I avoided the draft, and a year later, when I turned age 26, the Selective Service System rules eliminated me from the prime group of eligible men for conscription unless the President of the United States declared a national emergency. My first law school job in life in Mississippi from 1969 to 1973, the latter two years as a litigation specialist, with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law was the best decision I ever made in my life. 
While in Mississippi, I grew up as a professional person and laid the foundation of my career in the law. This paper will focus on my arrest in retaliation for zealously representing the poor and people of color in Mississippi. As a young African-American lawyer practicing law in Mississippi in the early 1970s, I was arrested twice in Mississippi within the first two years after graduating from law school. In both cases, retaliation by white officials appears to have been the motive for the arrest involving my legal representation of black persons who challenged racial discrimination. As a lawyer, I became the victim of the same type of injustice in the legal system as many of my clients. Though warned of this possibility before deciding to practice poverty and civil rights law in Mississippi, the reality of going to jail for conduct that most normal lawyers would undertake for their clients still surprised me on how low the dominant white culture would go to stifle access to justice for the poor and people of color. Ironically, the arrest related to my conduct in court. The first arrest took place in Oxford, Mississippi. The state of Mississippi charged me with a felony offense of practicing law without a license in a juvenile case. The punishment for such crime would have resulted in a sentence to prison for long years and a permanent disbarment from the practice of law. But the charge was only a pretext for two other more significant events in Oxford before the arrest. Michael Trister and Ken Spriggs, who we've heard about, the executive assistant director in North Mississippi, served as my lawyers. These outstanding lawyers quickly bailed me out of jail and immediately filed an injunction in federal court to stop the criminal prosecution on the grounds the local prosecutor acted in bad faith to interfere with my civil rights and legal representation. They also filed suit on behalf of one of the students who I shall explain the representation from the University of Mississippi. They also filed a suit for Ms. Miller Quarles and all the plaintiffs in the school desegregation suit. And Mike Trister, one of the lawyers, also filed a suit for himself and on behalf of Neighborhood Legal Services for all the people that would be represented uh, by the program. Thankfully, a federal judge issued an injunction that temporarily prevented the state criminal prosecution and the pending further legal proceedings, and I continue to practice law, although with a doubt, dark cloud hanging over my head for more than a year. Hence, in the first year of my legal practice, I became a party in two lawsuits, State of Mississippi versus Britain, the criminal case, and Britain versus the state, or Talmadge Littlejohn, the federal court, to enjoin the state's bad faith prosecution of me. Some friends suggested I should have left the state or at least refrained from taking controversial cases. Yet I was too young, too militant, and probably too unwise to listen. And at this point, I'd like to call up Michael Trister just to say a few words on the other side of representing me in that case. Mike, would you come forward? Just tell that little story. really rushing to get him, and they were in a, a big hurry. I called the prosecutor and said, you really have to give an extension here. This is ridiculous. It's, you don't have to have a trial tomorrow and, uh, and so on. And, uh, he, he wouldn't, and normally, that's the kind of thing, even for legal service lawyers, the opposing lawyers would normally uh, treat you with some respect and would agree to an extension. But he said, absolutely not. He was not going to do that. So I went up and saw Judge Smith in, in, in Your old friend by now. My, my old friend <laughs> Judge Smith uh, in Corinth and got him to issue an injunction to stop the prosecution from taking place. I got back to Jack to Oxford about, I think, seven or eight o'clock in the evening, and uh, I had this injunction in my pocket, so I knew there was not going to be a trial the next day. And uh, I said, you know, and I knew that the prosecution what had his witness was going to be the executive director of the state bar, and he was going to be driving up from Jackson in the morning. And so I thought, you know, if you're a nice guy, you would call the guy down there and tell him he shouldn't really be coming. And then I said, no way. 
<laughs> so I just put the injunction in my pocket. He drove all the way from Jackson, got up here, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, I showed up with my piece of paper saying, sorry, no trial today. <laughs> and uh, that's the story John wants to Anyway. As they say in many of the uh, trials I've handed, uh, Judge, may I uh, pass an exhibit uh, to the jury uh, to let them uh, view it. And I'm passing out an archive file from Kent Spriggs, who sent me the original legal pleadings in this case. And I teach civil procedure in law school. And this week, I passed around these pleadings and asked them if it stood the test of modern effectiveness on behalf of the lawyer. And they all said yes. So these pleadings are nearly 40 plus years old, and they still show the expert legal experience of my lawyers, Michael Chister and Kent Spriggs. Kindly <laughs> return it at the end. The second arrest occurred in court for what the judge called contempt during my representation of a black defendant who had been accused of rape and murder of a white woman. I had accepted the case in 1971 while at North Mississippi Rural, but outside the program case system and with my newly awaiting position as staff attorney for the Lawyers Committee in Jackson Litigation Office. Thus, the arrest technically did not occur a while at North Mississippi, but the circumstances directly relate to the same causal relations. After spending several hours in jail, the judge postponed the contempt proceedings to the end of trial if what I agreed to continue representing the defendant. Again, I dodged the bullet of any fine or sentence to jail and continued to practice law. I come to work at North Mississippi Rural Legal Services as a Reggie Fellow that you've heard about. The Reggies were specially trained legal services lawyers enlisted into President Johnson's War on Poverty and the National Services Program and employed by the Office of the Equal Opportunity at its Neighborhood Legal Services Program through a grant of the local nonprofit agency, as you've heard. A Reggie fellow lawyers differ from regular service lawyers in that Reggie's focused on large impact cases against the systemic causes of poverty and the inequality rather than the general services, such as divorce and qualifications for public assistance, both of which were very important. Within six months after I arrived, and only three months after I received a license to practice law, I filed my first school desegregation case against the Office of Public Schools and maintaining a racial segregation in a case style quarrels versus the Oxford Municipal Separate School District and the Lafayette County School District. Assistant Executive Director, as I said, and Litigation Director Ken Spriggs wisely guided me as the check and chair through every step of the process, and I'm still deeply indebted for Kent, helping me in my first federal case ever. In this process, 16 years after the court had decided landmark Brown versus Board of Education, the de jure segregation illegal, I observed firsthand that the high court's edict a year later in 1955 with the southern states to comply with, quote, all deliberate speed had not become a reality here in Oxford because they seemingly ignored it like any other school district. Although James Meredith became the first African-American admitted to integrate the University of Mississippi in 1962 with a court order and the assistance of the US Marshals and the National Guard troops, the local public schools remained separated by race with the black students attending inferior schools literally across the railroad tracks. Ken Spriggs and I had filed a school desegregation lawsuit against the separate Oxford in the neighboring uh, Lafayette County in federal court in December 1969 after two Supreme Court cases had ordered school boards to immediately dismantle the due system of education by race. Our clients won a preliminary injunction in January of 1970 that ordered the school board to desegregate the schools. And finally, the Oxford schools would become integrated, but I would pay a dear price. Next, a small group of African American students on the Ole Miss campus quietly and peacefully marched on the stage of the campus theater ironically doing a performance of Upward Bound, an internationally known singing group that promoted diversity and tolerance in the society. The Ole Miss black students sought to protest the continuing legacy of white racism on campus by the administration and by fellow white classmates. For an example, the university promoted 
the antebellum era culture with the popular election of the homecoming queen in a pageantry of all white females and the selection of the male Johnny Reb addressed in his Confederate regalia. In another instance, the whole university paraded the Confederate battle flag at all events to the chagrin of the black students. When the black students peacefully disrupted the performance of Upper Brown singers by silently walking across the stage, raising their black fists, and exiting the building, the campus police arrested all black students on the campus who were in the vicinity of the theater, regardless of whether they participated in the demonstration or not. The police transported dozens of these black students to the state's most infamous parchment prison farm. As several years later, a federal court would declare parchment prison unconstitutional and a violation of the Eighth Amendment to the US Constitution for cruel and unusual conditions, such as a trustee system where convicted prisoners, some for murder, guarded fellow prisoners, armed with the rifle and the authorization to shoot and kill federal prisoners. The black students retained me at North Mississippi Rural Services as their attorney to secure their release on bail and represent them in the local municipal courts where the prosecutor had filed simple misdemeanor charges of disorderly conduct against dozens of student demonstrators and non-demonstrators swept into the mass arrest. In response, I filed demands for a separate jury trial for all the defendants, primarily for the strategic purpose of clogging the small municipal court docket to slow the prosecutions. In addition, the University of Mississippi charged the arrested black students with administrative due process violations on campus. I invoked the due process procedures allowed by the student code and demanded individual hearings for all the students accused of misconduct, again, to bring the student administrative process to a halt. Once more, I succeeded, but the payback from state officials was soon to come. I believe the ongoing school desegregation case and the old Miss demonstration cases, simultaneously pending in the municipal court in the university honor system, along with my role in a juvenile case, probably provoked the authorities to conclude that they had had enough of me. Next, the state officials, through the city prosecutor, attempted to link my representation of a minor in a juvenile case with a criminal charge and an arrest for practicing law without a license. The local custom of judges in Mississippi present, permitted an attorney with a license to practice in another state and who resided in the state while working for full time for one of the public legal organizations to routinely appear in court. I was admitted to practice in my home state of Connecticut and to the federal courts here in Mississippi, and of course a resident staff attorney with North Mississippi Rural Legal Services. To legally appear in court, the out-of-state licensed lawyer, along with a resident lawyer, only had to obtain permission in what is called pro hoc vice, meaning for this case. Having satisfied the criteria of permission granted by the judge on the record and my appearance with a local lawyer from North Mississippi Rural Legal Services, we represented a minor child in a juvenile case. The prosecutor accused our minor client of making obscene telephone calls. My successful cross-examination in that case would instigate the charges leading to my arrest, and yet I would not have foreseen such at that time. The state's case against our minor client depended in large part upon the testimony of a technician from the telephone company. To identify a would-be caller with pranks of obscene phone calls, the telephone company used a pen register. After the victim reports an obscene call to the telephone company, it sends the victim a telephone number to call upon the next time she receives an unwanted call. In this case, a white woman complained that a caller made an obscene call, so she called this special number. When the victim dialed the special number, the system at the phone company made a printout on a computer card of the last number that had called the victim. Armed with the number generated on the card, the telephone company security office can trace the household where the unwanted call originated. Upon further investigation, in conjunction with local law enforcement officials and company security, the investigators can identify the possible suspects in the household from which the calls were made. Such a process occurred in the juvenile's case except for one significant detail that the investigators apparently overlooked. 
The company's technician witness correctly identified the telephone from which the call might have originated, but on my cross-examination of the prosecutor's witness, I asked him this punchline question. Did you know that number you identified by the tracking system belonged to more than one household? The answer was no. And further, did he know that other family had a minor child capable of making such an alleged obscene call belonged to a party line of two or more three households in a rural area of the county, one of which families had small children similar to my client's family? Again, the technician and the witness said no. And the rest was history that the telephone company and the prosecutor could not sufficiently identify the source of the harassing phone calls to our client by a preponderance of the proof. As I recall, the uh, delinquency charge was dismissed or adjudicated to a less serious outcome. And then there was the second arrest, though I previously stated, shortly after I departed North Mississippi Rural Legal Services. In the rape and murder case, a leading to my contempt citation and arrest by the sheriff, several illuminating highlights make the episode colorful and retrospect, though quite frightening at the time. To begin, the presiding judge in the case was the Honorable Marshall Perry, an avowed self-notorious racist. Another co-author of our book and better civil rights lawyer who you heard about, Armin Durfner, called the judge a lunatic too. <laughs> in addition, shortly before the case started, Judge Perry had run a doomed campaign for governor of the state on a racist platform to borrow from former Governor George Wallace, segregation now and segregation forever. To make matters even worse, Judge Perry had issued a court injunction in 1970, about a year before the trial, that barred a Mississippi court clerk from issuing a marriage license to an interracial couple, despite the fact that the Supreme Court of the United States had declared these anti-miscegenation statutes unconstitutional many years earlier in 1967. I accepted this murder case out of respect for a black lawyer and elder named R. Jess Brown. Brown was one of the original half dozen African American lawyers who first began practice in racially segregated Mississippi back in the 1950s. He asked me to co-counsel with him on behalf of the defendant, James Pilcher, a young black man, as I said, accused of raping and murdering a white woman in Carrollton, Mississippi in 1971. Brown, a short diminutive man, part Cherokee Indian, an African American ancestry with high cheekbones, light, you know, damn near white, <laughs> complexion, straight long mixed brown hair and silver, the length droping, dri dripping over his shirt collar, was a brave lawyer in those days. He served as legal counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, from New York City when they represented James Meredith in integrating Ole Miss in 1962. Brown had also represented Matt Charles Parker, a 20-year-old black man from Pearl County, Mississippi, who too was indicted for raping a white woman. Before the start of the trial, a group of white men entered the jail and lynched Parker in 1959. Brown warned me that a similar lynch mob mentality existed in Carrollton towards Pete, uh, Pilcher, so we stayed in a motel uh, during the trial in a far distant county. Upon entering the historic stately looking courthouse in the center of the small town on the first day of trial, I felt the remnants of the old South because the African American spectators who packed the courthouse still sat in the upper balcony formerly reserved for the colored only seating area, although the Civil Rights Act of 1964 had prohibited such segregation in public accommodations for seven years. Further, someone had tied a hanging noose and the knot in a thick, long rope that dangled from a tall tower in the building containing a bell. Things would get even worse. My co-counsel and I have filed a bevy of pretrial motions to disqualify Judge Perry based upon the express abject bigotry against African Americans. In addition, we asked the court to dismiss the indictment on the grounds of systematically excluding African Americans from the jury pool and for ineffective assistance of a previous white local lawyer for the defendant, Pilcher, who waived certain critical rights for the defendant. Still further, we requested a change of venue 
from the heavy racially biased atmosphere in the local community that prevented a black defendant from receiving a fair trial. Judge Perry denied every motion, but a hearing on the motion would lead to my arrest. As defense counsel, we requested a hearing to challenge the exclusion of African Americans from the jury wheel for which persons were selected for the grand jury <clears throat> and later determined probable cause that someone committed a crime and the petite jury that decides the guilt or innocence after a trial. We expected Judge Perry to deny the motion, so we asked the court to stipulate that no black person had ever served on the juries to preserve the issue of the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to the U.S. Constitution of a jury of their peers and for appeal in the event of a later conviction. Unfortunately, a Judge Perry refused to stipulate to the obvious facts, so we had to conduct a hearing to prove our claim. I had issued a subpoena to the circuit clerk, the custodian record for the persons that served on the juries, to appear on the first day of the trial with the information and to testify at a hearing. In my first appearance in court, the sparks immediately started to fly between the judge and me. I made a motion, motion to remove the hangman's noose tied to the rope and rang the bell on top of the courthouse. As a former Boy Scout, I knew the description for tying knots in ropes. I proceeded to recite how to tie hangman's knot for the record when the judge ordered me to stop because he did not care about some rope that rang the bell. I politely explained to the judge that I only was trying to make a record on appeal about the rope, the history of lynchings of African Americans in the South and that African Americans in the courtroom were seated up in the balcony except for the defendant and his two black lawyers located on the main floor. The cumulative evidence of these facts constitutes an atmosphere of racial hostility that denied a black client a fair trial, I'd argue. My reference to these facts exhausted what little proper judicial temperament and decorum, if any, the judge possessed. The judge denied my motion. Next came the straw that broke the camel's back. And the trial had not even started yet. After the clerk, a white woman, was sworn in and sat in the witness box, I asked her to concede that no African American ever served on a jury, at least during her long tenure as clerk of the court. She refused. I then introduced documents containing the list of persons who served on the juries in the past and proceeded to ask the clerk to identify the race of each of the persons on the list. The tension mounted in the courtroom. As the tedious process continued, with repetitive answers that each person on the list was white. Several times she feigned as if she did not know the race, but someone had educated me during my short tenure in Mississippi about one cultural feature of Southern white apartheid. Bigoted white people rarely ever mistaken an identified white person as being black. That would be the height of all insults. So I asked the person's address listed in the information with a hunch she really knew the person was white and would not insult that person. Then I followed with the question, if she meant to suggest that the person was black, the clerk, the clerk quickly remembered the name and confirmed the individual's race as white. At about this point, several hours into this examination, the judge snapped, pounded the gavel, and told me in no uncertain terms he'd had enough of these questions. As I attempted to protect the record, as lawyers say, in reciting my client's deprivation of his constitutional rights and listing the legal precedents of case law, the judge erupted and shouted that I was in contempt of court. He ordered the sheriff to take me to jail, and all hell broke loose in the courtroom with vocal disagreements between my co-counsel and even some persons in the audience. One of my fellow legal services lawyers and my dearest friends to date in North Mississippi Legal Services, whom I had invited to come to court off the clock, uh, Wilhelm. <laughs> Invited him to come to court to protect me in the event the judge held me contempt, shouted to the judge from the audience that the judge lacked sufficient grounds to arrest me. The judge responded by asking his name and who he was. He answered, Judge, David Littman, an attorney who come to defend me. The judge immediately held him contempt too and ordered his arrest along with me. Off we both went to jail. I cursed my friend the lawyer, notwithstanding his understandable outrage at such an injustice, but he had just blown his job to represent me. <laughs> I shall return to the ending of that saga in a moment. Uh, David Littman had intended to be here today, but he uh, had death in his family at the last minute, and he's actually at a funeral. 
Although I was arrested and charged with a felony crime for practicing law without a license that could have resulted in prison sentence and disbarment of me from practicing law, the charges were dropped by a mutual and unwritten statement. After a year of my arrest, I took and passed the Mississippi Bar Examination in 1971. And to the surprise of the civil rights lawyers in and out of the state, the Mississippi authorities admitted me to practice law without any examination of my fitness and my qualification, knowing of the pending felony charges against me. Hardly any state bar examining committee, either in 1970 or to the present, would admit an applicant who passed the bar without the character and fitness examination, knowing the prior investigation and the prior criminal charges were still pending. With such an implicit sense to let bygones be bygones concerning my arrest, although there was no formal settlement, I reciprocated by dropping my federal state prosecution injunction. And in contempt of court arrest, the judge and I negotiated through the back and forth messenger to the sheriff while in jail to suspend any action on the contempt until after the trial if I would return to the court immediately and continue to represent the defendant. You see, the clock and the money was ticking upstairs on the court time and on the court docket and all those jurors sitting in court, and I had refused to come out of jail unless the judge answered my demands. The sheriff would come down and negotiate, and you know how the more friendly white sheriffs were. He said, Lord Brayden, I never seen no lawyer sit in jail and negotiate with the judge like this. My God, you some man. <laughs> judge Perry nearly denied every motion I made in the case, and we repeatedly clashed during the trial until the all-white jury found the defendant guilty. But the jury sparred the accused the death penalty, and the judge punished him with life in prison without a parole. Thus, we won in the sense we saved Mr. Pilcher's life from the death penalty, and he was amazingly released from prison within 10 years because of a legal technicality regarding the lack of a definition of punishment by life under the Mississippi law. In the end, I guess Judge Perry decided to forgive me too because he dropped the contempt charges against me at the end of the case. And in conclusion, I too have forgiven Mississippi for what it did to me. Let truth and reconciliation in the past pave the way for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>